Well, Paul here, today on the bench of this casket radio, AM, antique AM radio, beautiful dial on it, bronze metal with uh, black printing on a white dial, and it has uh, AM, uh, um, roughly 500 to 1750 or so. And then it has it in a scale on the bottom in percentage of the band, 10, 20, 30, all the way up to 100% of the band. So, real interesting dial assembly. You see it has uh, S-shaped indicator connecting to the dial. And the knob. Wood case is in good shape. Got a little speck there. Most mostly okay. No, actually, excellent shape. A nice wood. Get little nicks and scrapes here and there. But look at that trim on the edge of that wood. It's just amazing. Beautiful tiger wood style case. Um, definitely lives up to its name of a casket radio. And it's a All American Five, and we're going to try to get it going. This tube socket, goat can way up in the air there, and the tube isn't all the way down. Don't know what's up with that. And it's got some kind of a control in the back. Don't know if it's original. Part of it, is, I guess it's original. It looks like part of it broke off, or it might have been added from something else, and here's a external antenna wire that's seen better days, but it would work, it's copper. And the line cord, well, you know, look, that's great. That's got another 50 years on it for sure. And a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of electrical tape, and we're good to go with the line cord. It's got a non-polarized plug. And uh, it looks like it might be an RCA lineup, I'm not sure. Uh, it's an interesting radio, obviously a rare model. And it has some information on the bottom. The line cord there tripping around. Uh, nice big screws. And it says it's a model 60A. Uh, 110 volt, 60 uh, cycle, 25 cycle on DC, so it's AM, I mean, uh, AC-DC style radio, and it says here that it's a BAL, B-A-L, never heard of them, and it's got the serial number, uh, BA-50, Eight one seven, a whole bunch of pa uh, patent numbers, which are very low numbers. The highest is one ninety two, one million nine hundred twelve, nine hundred twenty one thousand. So actually, I take that back. We can on one one million nine hundred sixty two thousand, which would put it around the twenties thirties. I would imagine um, I could pull one of those patent numbers up and the latest one and date the label within a couple years' time. And it says it's licensed for radio amateur experimental and broadcast reception under the following patents. So, mm, interesting. Interesting radio. So we'll go ahead and uh, do something about this and get it plugged in, see what it, what it does, and then go from there. Okay, the note that came with it says it's a travel lure or travel in Carinda, 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 hmm, never heard of them. Uh, but that's what it says. It is a 60A, 60A according to the model number on it, and they're saying it's a 1935. So anyway, let me go ahead and get it set up, and we'll see what makes it tick. Okay, there's uh, no short on the 
plug, or you'd hear that. So we're going to go ahead and plug it in. Okay, I got uh, my light dimmer on for sure and turn up the very act. And the bulb is not lighting, so so far no short. I'm going to leave it on around on about 85 volts. It's enough to make it tick. And let's see if it's doing anything. Okay, the light didn't come on. That's not a good sign. It should have come on a little bit. See if we're drawing any current. No, we're not drawing no current. The radio is dead. Okay, I'm going to have to get it out of his case. Could be the line cord is just broken somewhere, uh, but it's definitely not shorted. So anyway, we'll pull it out of his case and we'll take a look at it. Okay, here's the radio out of its case. And it has two pilot lights. And somebody had played with the string at one time. Is that what that is? Yeah. They tied the string together. Look at that's just weird. Okay, but it looks good. They put some super glue on it, so somebody's worked on it. Um it's getting though it's hard to find uh good virgin radios that haven't been played with. Um, whoever worked on it knew about super glue and yet left this cord on, so I'm like confused because um, that definitely looks like super glue, unless it's some kind of antique cord glue. Uh, looking at the capacitors, I'm seeing the same old stuff down there. So let's uh, let me see what we got for a tube line up here. We got a 43, which is 25Z5. I think they're all marked on the case, so we'll we'll deal with that in a little bit instead of playing with it. It's got a coil here. We've got to be careful of that guy. Still don't know what that switch is. Looks pretty original on the top section. I mean, it's got some original dust and dirt there on this coil, but and inside here it looks original. Not seeing anything tinkered with on the top. Electrolytic is still there. Let's look at the bottom. Oh, yeah. Look at those. Tubular condensers. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Check them out. Wow, those are nice. Those are cool. Look at all the detail in those labels. That is just unbelievable. Let me put my spectacles on here so I can read it. Um, well, it tells you the outside foil. The Sprague 600 line series. Working voltage, 600 volts. This one's a 0.01 microfarad. Tubular condenser, Sprague products. North Adams, Massachusetts, my hometown. USA, and they even have a patent number on them. Amazing. And then we have a uh, registered U.S. patent office, Beaver, B-E-A-V-E-R, dry electrolytic foil capacitor. And it actually is called a capacitor, isn't that something? Uh, Catalog number, uh, that may not be uh, original. Amazing. The line cord is why is a, is an interesting disaster here. Going to the rectifier tube, you see that's just all falling apart. So we gotta put a new line cord on there and it's got a, Check it out, electrical tape holding it in place. Somebody had changed the line cord at one time before. Well, we're gonna do them a favor and change it again. So apparently that was what was wrong with it in the past and they changed the line cord. And use this electrical tape here to hold it on. And that tape is probably 60s, maybe 70s. Notice how wide it is. It's a full one inch. Still sticky too. Even after all those years. 
Uh, maybe it was more recent, but I, I, judging by the condition of that cord, I would have to say it's at least 60s. And they used enough of it. They made it basically a cord restraint out of just line cord. I mean, I'm sorry, cord restraint out of just electrical tape. I figured it wouldn't fit through that bushing if they used a half a roll of tape. Still don't know what this switch is. Mm, it's an oak pattern pending switch. And it just looks like a uh, double pole, double throw switch. That's all it is. Double pole, double throw, and they're only using one of the uh, poles. So basically it's a switch that turns this on and off, whatever that is, probably some kind of high low band filter or something for bass treble. I don't know. Okay, here's something you don't see every day. It had um, this pink, this wire here coming from up above from the switch was connected to one side of the line cord. You can see some pink remnants of the of that copper there some pink on it where well, that was what connected it all came off when i cut it then it has this side going to one side of the rectifier tube that's the one that goes down here to this pin of the rectifier tube um i'm assuming it's a rectifier tube should be and then the other half looks like it just comes to this metal connector here, the splice, this was under the tape, and you notice how the wire is like tied around there. So, I think that's like, I don't understand how that's connected. I'm going to have to look in there. It could be that this has a resistor uh, sheeting in this cord, and I'm not seeing that anywhere where the cord is actually split. I'm not seeing no shielding. You know, sometimes these older radios use the cord, they use the resistor cord um, in line with the uh, rectifier tube in order to drop the resistance. Um, but what I'm going to do is try to get that clip off and see how that wire is connected. You notice it's silver, the other two are copper, so it'll be easy to distinguish one from the other. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and pop that clip off and then we'll look at it. Okay, I can hear those old timers back in the 40s and 30s and 40s saying, oh, he's just going to pop that clip off. Ha, 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 ha. I got it off, but I jammed my finger a number of times. Okay, so there it is. You see that silver wire is just wrapped around there and tied on there. Well, hopefully you can get an idea what that looks like. I just wrapped around on there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and take it off. Well, yep, there it is, and that's what it is. It's obviously wrapped down the length of the cord, and it's a resistor wire. You see it's coming out of the cord there, and this was coiled around it, and then that wire was crimped to it with this crimp. So we're going to figure out what the resistance of that wire is, and put a power resistor in here to take its place. Interesting. It's coiled all the way down the cord, you know, like an electric heater wire coil. And it just builds up a resistance when it gets hot. And we need to find out where it connects on the plug side. So that's the next thing I'm going to do is pull the plug out, take a look at it. And the plug's definitely got hot. At one point, you can see that brass screw there has been hot. So there was, somebody had some fun with a short. Looks like that's that wire there, but I'm not sure yet.
Let me go ahead and unscrew it. Okay, there you have it. And you can see that um, coil wrapped around the wire there. And it's wrapped about an eighth of an inch turns all the way up that lead of the wire. And that's a resistor built into the line cord. That explains why the line cord was never replaced and you know, they just kind of like kept it separated somewhere along the line it touched and shorted, got the plug hot. And you see it arced there, probably when that little wire broke off and just made an arc to it. See it down in there still. And we got arced on that side. So, we got to find a, re a resistor to replace that cord. Um, I'm going to try to pull up the schematic and see how many ohms that joker is. And then, of course, it's inductive. It's not just the resistance of the wire. It's the actual inductance of that coil uh, as it was wrapped all the way down that line cord. Uh, so you have the resistance of the wire, and then you have the inductance of the coil. And between the two, it creates a uh, impedance that drops the um, voltage. Now, the inductance wouldn't be that much because, um, though it is a lot of turns, it's a 60 hertz line cord, and then you'd also run on 25 hertz, so, you know, the inductance would be kind of low on that wire. It'd be some, there'd be a magnetic field around that strand of the wire, but um, not enough to create a lot of inductive reactants, but more than just straight DC resistance. So we need to find out what it would be and here's the wires that were wrapped around and this one here this thin one let me get them separated this is the one that was the actual inductor wire and it wrapped around this one too and i believe that that's the pink wire no it's not the pink wire it's the other wire so it connected to the strand that was not pink. So this pink wire goes to one half of the line cord. These two went to the other half of the line cord, but they were joined together. This one went straight to the line cord. This one is the one that is on a resistor going to the line cord. So there's a voltage drop there in series with the... Uh, it looks like that's the filament string here of this tube. This one connected to the filament string, so it had a resistance going to the filament string, which would make sense because this would most likely be a series string with um, filament string. And you had a resistor here. This is a power resistor. I don't know what the resistance is. It's uh, two resistors with a center uh, resistor with a center tap, and it connects to the other filament. So this is one side of the filament here, which also connects to these two pins of the tube. Hmm, that's just weird. Okay, so these are connected together, yet there's a resistance on this one. Really strange. It's like, what difference does that make? This makes absolutely no sense. If this one was a resistor line and this one wasn't, what is a resistor line actually doing? Because they got a wire going from here to here. Somebody might have tried to bypass that resistor at some point. But that sure looks... Oh, I'm mistaken. Okay, that wire goes behind there. It looked like it was attached. It wasn't attached, so it is in series. It's in series with the line cord. This is where the filament comes in, and it comes out here, goes to this resistor, comes out the other side here, goes to another tube, or the field coil up there, comes back from the field coil and goes, it continues the... Um, um, 
series resistance string. Okay, so I gotta find out what that is. And put a resistor there. And then the next thing is, I wanna power it up. I mean, I, this, this is a dry electrolytic. I'm sure it's shot, so we might have some hum. And these here are wax capacitors, as you can see. They're gonna have to go. They're cool, but they're gonna have to go, especially this depth capacitor here to the chassis actually of all cities connected to the chassis uh, they're not death capacitors they were all that way in the 30s i'm sure there's across the line somewhere going to the chassis because this chassis is grounded everywhere so i'll have to put another power resistor in series with this one and i don't think it'll be that much maybe a couple hundred ohms and uh for testing, you know, basically just keep the voltage down on that rectifier tube, if it's even good. I haven't checked any of the tubes. In fact, we can, uh, well, we got tubes in parallel, but we can go ahead and jump across that and see if we get any continuity. Let's go ahead and check some of these uh, filament string lines here. Bear with me as I get my probes organized. Okay. Okay, we should get some beeping. Let's see if I can do this with my camera in my hand at one time. Okay, that's not good. We are. Yep. That's not good. That rectifier tube is shot. See that? The filament has no. Um, Oh, duh. I take that back. I wasn't on the rectifier filament. This is the filament string. Okay, the rectifier tube filament is fine. This tube filament, fine. This one, I say fine. You know, it could be going somewhere else, but I think they're fine. And this one. Yep, and I think what saved this, there's another one over here behind all this. I think what saved this is people were afraid to uh, play it with the um, line cord in the way it was, so it probably sat in a closet for a long time. Yep, so all the two filaments test fine initially, that's without pulling them out. Um, we can test them. One by one, the only way there would be continuity on them is either the film is good or there's a short. And I don't think there's a short, so I would assume the filaments are good. If I had an open load, then I would be concerned that one of the filaments is bad. Um, I've got my cool little box here. I don't know if I ever showed you guys this. I think I have. This is a filament tester. Unfortunately, it won't work on these tubes. And now that I think about it, uh, these these tubes are old. They have the giant um, um, filament pins. You see the pins are bigger around than the others. So I can't really demonstrate that on that, but I didn't have to. Just ohms meter does fine. So let me pull up a schematic. And we'll figure out what that resistor needs to be. And we'll try to get some power to this thing. Okay, here's the schematic for this uh, Traveler 60A. And it's dated, it looks like August 5th, 1935. Actually, it looks like 1925. I can't tell. 25, 35, let's see, maybe the top one will be clearer. Uh, 35, okay, there we go. So it's a 1935. And they had a DC version, battery radio, which uh, used number 34 tubes. And then they had this one, which was um, 
110 volts, 60 hertz or 25 hertz, and runs on DC also. And here's the twisted line cord. Of course, it doesn't give me the resistance value, so I have to figure it out. It's got a coil, choke coil going to ground of 400 ohms to measure the choke coil. And here's the rectifier, 25Z5. Interesting schematic. They didn't even draw the circles around the tubes back then on this particular brand. It has three electrolytics, a 12, a 16, and an 8. Not in that order. And um, 5 milliwatt voice coil. Um, looks like 5 milliwatt. Anyway, and then uh, the voltage divider here going into the grid of the 43 output tube. Very interesting circuit. Here's the antenna, and then you have your um, tuning condenser here. Look at how they drew that. The con capacitor with an arrow on it. <laughs> and there's the other side. The oscillator side, the so antenna trimmer and oscillator uh, um, capacitor. And he uses a model six, 6A7 for the uh, um, oscillator converter tube, and 6D6 for first um, fire for amplifier. So you got the first and second IF stages here. And you have a, I don't even know what that is, 15, 45, whatever. Um, let's see. 75. Truncated. 75 is the uh, detector preamp tube. It's just uh, basically a diode. And there's the two diodes for the um, detector and there's a preamp for the amplifier tube and then that goes to the speaker through the uh, output transformer and this is the voice coil with a choke looks like a choke coil then and I'll look at that um, fuel coil so that's also part of the resistance and the filaments where are the filament strings Hmm. Now I showed a filament string. Interesting. It's there. Yeah, they don't show any of the filament line. But we got a 43. The 25, the 68, and 75, that's not working right, so that don't work. I'll have to figure that one out. Um, but there should be a series string. I'll have to pull up these tubes to find out what their filament voltages are. I know the 25Z5 is a 25 volt tube, those two are 6 volt tubes, so you 12 volts there. Not sure about the 75 and the 43, what their filament rating is. There were a lot of them, but I never dealt with one that didn't have the filament string on it. But now I got to calculate it because I need to know what that coil, that twisted wire is doing, what it's doing to the uh, voltage. Interesting symbols they got there too. Check out those two symbols. This one's like a almost like an upside down ground signal, but it's not. It's like a minus plus and a plus and a minus here. Just really weird. So that would be, I guess, a grounded here off this part of the rectifier tube over the capacitor, and this is uh, across the line capacitor, so it does have a death capacitor. Notice 
this capacitor has no value. So that could be an inductive capacitance of this twisted pair, I don't know. It doesn't have a value, so we don't know what it is. But if it's in there, I'll find it. And then um, these will have values. This one doesn't have a value. It's a one mega ohm resistor, but it has no value on this capacitor. 0 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.25, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, but None on this one. Strange. None on this one either. So, fortunately, they're very easy to read. So, <laughs> we'll find out what they are. But, uh, yeah, it is one, two, three. Oh, no, that's in the coil. I'm sorry. Three. It's three without values. One, two, three. Three of them without values. Interesting. So, this didn't help me too much. I mean, yeah, I needed a schematic. That'll definitely help. It's a very simple circuit. I mean, look at that. Very simple. And it's um, directly coupled through the IF cans. Until so you get over here and you get a capacitor coupled from the detector tube to the... Uh, Audio, your first audio part of the detective tube to the output amp is capacitive coupled. But these are just IF coupled one into the next and down the string. Very simple diagram. Got a few coils here that operate the oscillator circuit. And you get your antenna trimmer and your oscillator trimmer. Uh, co condenser there. Interesting. One meg, one meg, so 0.5 meg. Most of the resistors are measured in megs. Um, hmm. 0.5 meg. So it looks like the smallest resistor is half a meg. I don't know. I don't know about this one. 1.5 MW, not sure what that is. Um, I'm not sure what that is. Um, oh, that might be milliohm, which would be 1.5K. Usually they have M for K and meg, they write out if it's meg. But it looked like a W, so I was confused. But that might be an old handwritten omega sign, ohm sign. So, interesting little radio. Not a lot to it. Going to be fun. And uh, there you have it. But i got to figure out a resistance. So I'm going to try to figure out what these, find out what these tubes need for their filament. Then I need to verify that the filaments are all in series. Looks like um, they're in series and probably parallel to this this setup here. So this, but uh, I need to find out what they are so we can get the resistance, the um, voltages to total 120 volts. I think it'd be a good time to update this anyway because now mains is like 120, 126 volts. Way back then it was 110, you know, 115 max. So we can calculate what these tubes require and put a, a line resistor in there to make up the difference from the actual filaments of the tubes. Because we don't want to hurt any of the tubes. We get them conducting and then we'll figure it out from there. I would imagine this radio will probably play just the way it is. Might have some hum. Anyway, there you have it. There's the, the uh, schematic for it. So we will continue.